family's behind me, my parents, Karen's family's behind us, we get in a jam, you know, brother-in-law, sister-in-law's all show up, my sister's working here now, you know, my brother-in-law's all are always supporting us. Family's a huge part of this business here. Just recently I hired my sister Jamie to come and be a salesperson for us as well. You know, there's not enough hours in the day for me to run around and do all this stuff, so I need people that are passionate and care about what we're doing here, and we've been really lucky to have those kind of people. I got three kids that are involved with this. Uh, you know, my, my middle daughter Sierra actually does a lot of farmers markets and sells a lot of our products all over Alberta actually. Um, I got a little granddaughter now too, and uh, one of the barrels in the back room it's got her name on it. I made it actually the day after she was born and it says happy 18th birthday Lila on it and uh, it's going to be a pretty good batch of bourbon by the time that rolls around another 16 years from now. The thing I enjoy the most is experimenting and making new products, uh, trying to come up with recipes that nobody's ever tried before. We've been pretty successful with that. We made some neat stuff, Saskatoon berry flavored vodka. Uh, we do a wild rose gin where the main ingredients are wild rose hips and, and wild rose petals. Uh, and it's really nice to make products that are good quality that nobody's ever done before. We're trying to be leaders in this industry and uh, as long as we keep pushing the barriers all the time, people are going to have to really work to try and keep up with us. The defining characteristic of a gin that is, is that it has a juniper or piney taste to it. And gin is a fun thing to play with. It's actually the hardest thing for us to do consistently. Uh, you know, uh, doing uh, vapor infusions, uh, you're fighting against the ambient air pressure all the time. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's the funnest thing to do because you can be so creative. Uh, I've got this creative uh, bone in my body that needs a release. I think that people have that type of thing. They need either music or art or something like that to help them. Uh, and I find a lot of creativity in creating our flavored vodkas and especially in creating our gin. One day I was sitting in my office and this guy walked in and he had a, a wood carving with him. He was going around door to door trying to sell these things that he was doing in his garage and they looked pretty good. I said, you know, if you want, you can put your carvings in our little store that we have here and we'll, you know, you can try and sell them out of there. He was kind of shocked that I was willing to do that, but our whole idea is about supporting local. And he came up with the idea after the uh, Humboldt bus crash of maybe sitting down and doing a collaborative project where we carved together because he knew I had a bit of uh, carving background and that we would carve a life-sized hockey player with angel wings and donate it to the Humboldt Arena once they get fired up in September again. After the tragedy, I couldn't financially help support like everybody else did. And I thought, what better way to try to offer them something through carving. I think a lot of times when you make something like that, it comes right in the heart. Yeah, yeah, I just sketched it out. I worked there quick at Coffee Break. Doesn't look like much now, but that's a general idea. It's gonna be a hockey player in stance. We're definitely gonna support him with it as much as we possibly can. I'm gonna work with him carving it. We're gonna get all of our social media networks to put out that we're doing this, and we're gonna try and generate some donations to go along with this thing. It's a tragedy that's touched a lot of people in Canada. If a person doesn't have money to give, they can spend time and create something and give it, and I think it even has more meaning when you do that. The wings are going to be completely independent of it, okay. so they're going to be kind of half wrapped around maybe a quarter of the way behind them so you can get the full effect of the hockey player as well. And you were saying you wanted to do this life-size if you can? Yeah, life-size yeah. if you can. My buddy Sean was doing some sourcing of some logs. It was hard to find something that big. Last night we ran out to Smart Firewood. He has donated some huge stumps that we can use for the tours. If you're willing to let me help out on this, I'd like to do a little bit of carving with you. Absolutely. I'm still learning out this process, right? Okay. Just a little over a year into it, so it'll be fun. I think it'll be great. Absolutely. It's a big project. It's going to take some time. So Absolutely. Two saws working on it a little better. All right. All right. It's going to look good. That yeah, sounds good. Let's go outside and have a look at these logs. This carving with this uh, hockey player, it's going to be a lot of time, a lot of energy, but it's definitely something that's coming from the heart. There we are. So these are some old poplar stumps. They're three years old, pretty dry. I think they'll work. That'd be a good torso piece. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. And then you could do the legs as a separate piece in the back. Legs, head possibly, yeah. yeah. Sound good? Perfect. All right, deal. Hey, you brought some other carvings? I did. Let's have a look at those. Three pieces, two carvings. But I had a bit of an unfortunate accident this morning. What happened? <laughs> the ear decided to come through the window. No. <laughs> <laughs> A little duct tape and garbage bags to fix that. Oh, there's always something goes wrong. Absolutely. No way, that's fantastic. We'll get a sparker. You did all this with chainsaw? Chainsaw, Dremel tools. 
Ryan hasn't done much painting. You know, he's experimented with uh, with food coloring and and using some acrylic paints. Um, I have a bit of a history with airbrushing, so. Uh, I wanted to offer some help and, and if he was open to it, some mentorship and maybe teach him how to run an airbrush and get a little more complexity into his paint jobs. Oh, this is all food coloring and this is actual wood stain. So I was experimenting and yeah, looking kind of wood. That's all uh, black copper. Black copper. Yeah. Similar to what those stumps we have here. Absolutely. That's good. What else you got? I have a turtle. I finished one o'clock this morning. One o'clock this morning? Oh, well, you work the same kind of hours we do. <laughs> Aside from carving your typical chainsaw carvings, you know, bears and eagles, uh, Ryan does some custom work. So he, he brought out a, a ninja turtle that he had just finished, and he also brought out a gremlin. Uh, he does some pretty amazing work. <laughs> oh, a little oh. bit of metal mixing with the wood, I thought it looked pretty good. That's really cool. That's for gentlemen and anything here. Oh, he's, he's getting a hell of a deal. You do custom orders like this? Yes, I do. No kidding. I think you do just load anything, obviously. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only a year into this, a little over, so it's all still learning process, right? I'm impressed, man. Thank you. Fantastic stuff. When I was a kid, my dad worked for Ducks Unlimited for quite a long time, over 30 years. So we spent a lot of time in the outdoors, hunting, fishing, that sort of thing. When I was about 13 or 14, he put me in a course to learn how to carve duck decoys. And they're the kind that you have sitting on your coffee table in your living room. So decorative duck decoys, all painted up fancy. Not the type you would actually use for hunting. The course that I was in was being taught by one of the top carvers in North America. And I was the youngest guy in there by 50 years. Everybody else was retired. Yeah, he started that in high school. He didn't know he was an artist back then. And uh, he gave it to me. I was his critic and his expert. Advisor. And it turned out that I had a pretty good knack for it. Uh, the first decoy that I ever carved, my dad didn't tell me. He, he took it and put it in a competition. Yeah, but this is meticulous work. There's like 17 <laughs> years of painting in that. I took it and I put it in into a decoy contest show in Winnipeg, national competition, and he won first prize. I did that as a, on the side as a part-time job the whole time I went to school and, and as I was going to university too. That carving is where this creativity kind of comes from that I love to, to feed off of. Apparently we're running low on Wild Rose Gin, so we gotta make another batch. Hey baby, how are you? <laughs> are you coming to work? No, I can't work today. How come? I'm going for massage. A massage, really? We're almost at a double-double and Bailey's not here today. I can come work tomorrow. You'll be all limber and ready to go then. My wife Karen and I went to dental school at the same time at the U of A. She went through dentistry, I went through dental hygiene. We took separate paths, we each had careers and lives and then kind of converged again about uh, almost 20 years later. So our friend Jordan from DCTV was hanging around a little bit and he let slip one day that he hadn't been to the dentist since he was in high school. So my good buddy Jeff Stewart over at Raycon Distillery that we've partnered up with our uh, Danger Cats Vodka on gives me a shout this morning. He says, hey, I got a big surprise for you. Can you meet me in Leduc at this address at this time? I'm like, hell yeah. What are we getting into? Wouldn't tell me. It's a different address than the distillery. So I got this much idea what the hell we're getting into. Only one way to find out. Just about there. 3.13 p.m., 17 minutes early. It's a rare occurrence for myself. Usually about 71 minutes late. I have no idea where the heck we are. None of those look like alcohol in a good time to me. Where are we? Are we in the right spot? I think so. You said that we were. Well, I don't. Isn't his wife's name Karen? Yeah, his wife's name is Karen. Dent? I, didn't, I don't know if she's a dentist still. Yeah. Set up a meeting with him at Karen's clinic. He walked in the door and there was a chart waiting for him to, be, to fill out. So uh, he was a good sport about it. Are you Jordan? Hi there, I am. Yeah, I have no idea what I'm, okay, well, I'm in Helen, for, but uh, Helen, I'm Jordan. Uh, here to help you get your chart filled out and... Chart filled out? Yeah. yeah 
Oh, am I? You got it. We got it. Karen. You get in. Get in the so I'm get getting the worked on. Yeah. I'm not a fan of the dentist. <laughs> Jeff and I are not friends. Okay. So one, two. Okay. Awesome. Let me be the first to say, I'm a grown man, not very tall, but grown, and I do not like the dentist. I did. He had no idea this is what was going on. This guy right here. There you go. <laughs> we're not friends. <laughs> You're lucky I like you, or I would not. Oh, I'm doing I, you a favor. I am not a dentist guy. You were like so many young guys I know. That I am. You went to the dentist when you were a little kid. Mom and then when you got away from your folks and they didn't have insurance anymore, you haven't gone for Are you doing this? Absolutely. The hell? Seriously? Yes, absolutely. So this is what I did for 23 years before starting up the distillery. I'm down only four hours a week, actually. Well, well it's funny. I knew your wife was Karen. I showed up here and I'm like, I asked the camera, are we in the right spot? Yeah. I'm like, well, his wife's name's Karen. I'm like, yeah, I didn't know she was a dentist. There you go. So we're going to take care of you. Well, I thought Karen was going to take care of me. I'm a lot more shaky <laughs> She'll now. Have a look at after. <laughs> Helen helps me all the time. Uh, she, her and her husband actually been on lots of motorcycle trips with us too. Okay. So good friends as well as uh, co-workers. Doesn't matter what the business is, you need to keep the people around you. So we have a fantastic group of just like at the distillery. And I'm stuck with LaRue and Hack. <laughs> <laughs> Helen's going to take some x-rays on you first. Oh, my favorite. And then we'll uh, come in and get you cleaned up. Karen will check you, see if anything needs to be fixed. And then we'll kick you out of here. You're lucky I like you or I would not be here in this. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> Jordan was pretty apprehensive when he first sat down on the chair. The x-rays are first, Helen. The x-rays are first. We're going to take four. Four. So how bad do they look? You definitely got all four wisdom teeth in there. It would have been great if, you're, if you got these out when you were 18, because you would have healed up in like four days. Something I've done with my patients over the years always, you can ask any of them, is I talk non-stop while they're in the chair, tip back. And, and the reason I do that is to try and take their mind off what's happening inside their mouth. The neat thing about it is if you do that over the years with the same patients, you really get to know them well, and they get to know you too. You know, uh, Building that relationship with people is really important, I think. It's a trust relationship, and how can you trust somebody that you don't know anything about? You know, So, uh, so we always want to make sure that when people come to the dental clinic, they feel comfortable and they feel like they know who is sitting down and, and looking at them and, and getting them to open their mouth. I will go and get Karen and she'll come and check them up. Awesome, and thank you. Then you're all done. Free to go. Jeff was saying you guys do a lot of volunteer work abroad. Yes. That's well, pretty cool. We call Kindness in Action and we go do dental work on poor people down there that need it. So where do you mostly go? South and Central America. Okay. I've been to every country in Central America. So wow. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. I test him every time I see him now to see if he's flossing or not. <laughs> I think he survived the visit and it's none the worse for wear. Ryan's uh, just recently made a transition uh, to a full-time wood carver and uh, you know that's a daunting task when you're used to getting a regular paycheck so uh, we want to help him sell his products anywhere we can. We, th we think he has an amazing talent, good local, uh, local product here. My sister owns Grandeur, a new store at the new outlet mall by the airport. And we thought it'd be a great place for Ryan to sell some of his wood products, his bears. While we were at Jessica's store introducing Ryan to Jessica at Grandeur, uh, we had to pick a parcel up actually that Karen had organized. Yeah, we got a sign made for um, Jeffrey's Grammy that made you cry when you picked it up. It but. did. I didn't actually know that Karen was doing it. So, you know, my grandmother's getting up there a little bit in age. And every time you get to spend time with her, it's an absolute gift. Uh, and we really wanted her to know that uh, every, how everybody feels about her. We just love her to death. We're very lucky to have that many generations so close together that, you know, that's my grandmother and I'm a grandfather. So, you know, five generations sitting around a table, you don't see that very often. We made a batch of gin today, our London Fog Dry Gin. Most people don't know this about gin, but gin is actually flavored vodka. Uh, you take vodka and you infuse it with the juniper berry. Uh, we gotta have a little bit of that uh, juniper berry or that pine salt taste in your flavored vodka, otherwise you can't 
classify it as a gin. It's just another flavored vodka. So we make three types of gins here. The London Fog Dry Gin is uh, one of our uh, traditional London dry gins. So juniper flavor, a little bit of lemon peel, and a little bit of coriander. So a nice traditional gin. And that's what we're making today. And you make up a tea bag. Uh, this little cheesecloth bag has to have juniper berries in it to be called gin. Um, I don't really like gin that tastes like pine salt, which a lot of a lot of gins that have a lot of juniper to them tend to have that flavor, in my opinion. So instead of filling this little tea bag up complete with juniper berries, we only put a few in there, and we fill the bag instead with wild rose hips, wild rose petals, crab apples, Saskatoon berries, things that we forage ourselves here actually, and it's all local ingredients, so it creates a very local flavor for our wild rose gin. The real gin traditionalists don't really like that gin because it isn't piney enough for them. So we also make a traditional London dry gin. And the, the way that it works is you take this tea bag and you stick it in the top of the still. You put some heat onto that vodka and you redistill it. And as the vapor passes through the tea bag, it picks up the flavors and aromas of whatever you put in there. So you can be really creative about what you put in that tea bag. You know, you could really put just about anything in there. Uh, what you do is you fill your still, uh, and in our case we use our old moonshining still, a little jelly bean there, and we fill it up with vodka that's been through our entire process already. This is 100% a sorry, 40% potato vodka. All polished, all ready to go, so it's our premium vodka that we use to make the gin with. It's a 27 gallon still, and it's about 100 liters. You don't want it completely full, but you want it up to the handle at least. The other two flavors of gin that we make is a Wild Rose Gin. That was the very first gin that we made. It's a flowery complex gin uh, with lots of botanicals, flowers and spices in it. So we put all kinds of botanicals in it, Wild Rose Hip being the majority of the flavor in it. We also put in crab apple from Jeff's Family Farm. It's got a fruity sour taste to it. Uh, it goes really nice with ruby red pink grapefruit juice. The other gin that we make is a lemon gin. It's not your stereotypical lemon gin. We actually leave it at 40% alcohol and we don't put any sugar in it at all. We take 20 lemons, we put them in a nice muslin bag and we drop it into our vodka in our still and we steep it for two days. We take those orange peels and lemon peels that we steeped with and we put them in a little muslin bag or a tea bag and we hang that in the top of the still in a gin basket. We add our coriander and our juniper berries and then we run that vapor infusion through the still and it comes off tasting like lemon gin. Oh, this gin is tasting nice. This gin's still coming off real good. The proof's starting to go down on it a bit, so usually we get this, this pail full and then we shut her down. So throughout the run, the flavors change. At the beginning, it'll be real fruity and floral, and now it's getting to the juniper stage, so it's got a lot of pininess to it now. Come along pretty nice. That's a tough liquor to make. There's a lot goes into it. You know, the last thing we have to do is get it put in a bottle, get it sealed up properly and labeled, and off to you. We got plans to have a great outing today. We're heading out to Grouse Nest. It's a little nine hole course. I'm not sure who won the <laughs> golf game. I'm not a golfer, I golf a couple times a year. And the reason I golf is to spend time with people I want to spend time with. It's a Cinderella story. You're shooting 120 with a seven iron. <laughs> He's got a good look at the pin. It's a beautiful shot. It's in the bush! <laughs> it's in the bush. <laughs> well, you might have pulled it a little bit, but it was nice. I trained a Titleist score, please. <laughs> yeah. We get out to Grouse Nest every once in a while. I usually try and bug places. I said, hey, you, you carry any craft spirits? So now Grouse Nest is carrying our double double. So if you're out there and you're looking for something to put in your coffee, just mention to them that uh, you heard about Rig Hand and, and they'll be happy to pour you some double doubles. Mom and Dad have this great acreage out uh, past Stony Plain. You know, it's, it's the gathering spot for the family. 
You know, the kids live out in Edson, a couple of them do. You know, it's about halfway from there to our place. And they've got room to host everyone. Having a family barbecue there is something that we do quite often, actually. I wish we did it more, but uh, it's hard to get everybody in the same place at the same time when everybody has busy schedules. So this was a great day. We had almost everybody there. When we took that present that Karen's sister made up and gave it to Grammy, you know, we had to hold it back a little bit so she could read it, but uh, I could see her tearing up a little bit. So, so did quite a few people in the room, actually. All in all, it was just a fantastic day. My grandmother's up visiting from Southern Saskatchewan, from Gull Lake. For her to be around all that family, uh, it, I know she had a fantastic time. It was nice to actually have the barbecue out at my parents' acreage because that's where Karen and I actually got married. We got married under a crab apple tree there. Uncle Brian that was visiting from England is actually the one that performed the ceremony for us. That apple, we actually picked the crab apples off of that tree and that's part of our mixture that we use for making our wild rose gin. So, uh, you know, it, that gin comes right from the heart. We've been telling you guys all about our family business. Well, this is our family here. Uh, we're missing a couple people. Sierra and Tyler aren't here. Will's not here. Aaron's not here. But they're all coming. We're going to have a great barbecue tonight. Normally, my family is not this calm and quiet. They're actually crazy, like this. Hey!